Looking out across the Irish Sea from here in Dublin towards Liverpool after the UK election, it seems that the political fog is lifting. But are things really any clearer? Well, one thing is sure, admitting openly that you are a Tory is still a bit like announcing to being partial to some of the stranger practices at the deviant end of the fetish world. Better keep those sort of details to yourself. Now, obviously, the punters said one thing in public, but in the privacy of their own booths, they revealed their weird side and they voted Conservative. So the British people have spoken, but no one seems quite sure exactly what they've said. At first, it looks like more of the same. You've got an old Etonian Tory surrounded by other tots rocking up to an elderly queen with a speech that she is instructed to deliver to her subjects. I mean, if you turned this into a black and white movie with a Pathé News voiceover, this could be the 1950s. But it's not the same. To borrow from WB Yeats writing in 1915 about Irish nationalism, all has changed, changed utterly. I mean, after this election, the so-called United Kingdom is about as united as the Liverpool FC dressing room. <laughs> Welcome to the Balkanisation of Britain. We now have anti-English, pro-European nationalists in Scotland, anti-European, pro-British nationalists in England, spiced up with a few anti-English, pro-European nationalists in Wales, and of course, the anti-each-other, pro-whatever-you're-having-yourself, British and Irish nationalists in that blissfully incoherent chunk of Ulster, Northern Ireland. Confused? The People's Front of Judea, anyone? Oh, Judea, People's Front. So is David Cameron a bit like the Pasha, the last Ottoman emperor in the Balkans of the North Atlantic? Not only does he have to keep Britain together, but he also has to keep the UK in the European Union. And he's got to perform this feat of constitutional gymnastics while staunching levels of fiscal incontinence that would make a leaky Italy blush, while at the same time avoiding an Argentinian-style flight of capital if the entire project breaks apart. And if all this wasn't enough, Pasha Cameron has also got to change the daily habits of the natives. Now, economically, to get British productivity off the floor, which is, after all, the source of its economic fragility, the Pasha has to get the English to behave more like the Germans, investing in real industry rather than trying to get rich in the housing casino every couple of years by buying and selling overvalued bits of Britain to each other, all financed with other people's money. Right now, the Brits borrow just under £300 million a day to maintain their lifestyle. A mortgage standard of living is rented, not earned. So the Pasha Cameron has to fix the economy while at the same time doing all these sort of backroom deals with the various tribal factions. And his real opposition in England isn't the Labour Party, it's the right-wing, anti-European end of his own party who are much more like UKIP than old-fashioned One Nation Tories. And speaking of UKIP, these sort of golf club revolutionaries, while they only might have got one seat, four million people actually voted for them. This is a bigger number than the entire population of Wales. But let's stand back a bit. What actually happens in reality is once politicians get into power, they begin to compromise and make deals. Now, if you doubt this, look at the behaviour of Sinn Féin in Northern Ireland. Our one-time freedom fighters have gone from being on the blanket to being under the duvet, more concerned about civil partnership than civil war. All that Armalite and Semtex stuff is gone, replaced by lovely, cultured debates about bicycle lanes and carbon footprints. And what about the Scots? Deep in the Scottish DNA is a commercial concern about the economy and their back pocket. As I've heard said once, 
The Scots are the only race that can buy from the Jews and sell to the Dutch and still make a profit. But Cameron's real problem is the English. Can he put the genie of English nationalism back in the bottle after he's taken it out and probably stoked it during the referendum on EU membership? And if the English vote no, will the Scots choose to stay in a UK dominated by England but without being in Europe? This election is the beginning, not the end, of a process. Cameron has a choice. He can either keep his country together or keep his party together. He can break with the EU, force the Scots to go, and in so doing ensure that the Conservative Party remain the permanent party of government in a much smaller UK, or allow the Scots to hold the English to ransom permanently. Over the next couple of years, the UK is going to be like a 21st century version of Westeros, with all classes of warring factions. In fact, the UK is like Game of Thrones without all the sex. Mm -hmm.